A Lantern, Chapter 12 There was very little crop that fall. The settlers learned that sod corn never amounts to much. What few ears formed well fed to the stock. I don't care. I'm not disappointed, he said. I knew it would take a year to get a start. But Abby knew it was not so. Abby knew that Will cared. The stubble and roots rotting all winter in the newly broken fields fertilized the ground, and so it was with high hopes that Will went into the field the first spring of the 70s. Abby's summer was one of fighting sickness. In addition to her many tasks, both children had the measles and the whooping cough later, as did the Rheinmuller's three and Sarah Lutz's new baby daughter, Emma. The mothers doctored them as well they could with simple remedies catnip tea and Indian herbs, hanging over their beds, watching anxiously for every change. When the children came out from under the cloud of illness, Abby felt that it was like coming out of a dark cavern into the sunshine. Once more she sang at her tasks. The crop of 1870 was only fair. So much hard work for so little results. Nothing but the cottonwoods seemed to thrive luxuriantly. Already, after their second summer, some of those which they had brought from the sandbars were as tall as Will. Their little shimmering dancing leaves were a solace to Abby. They seemed courageous and cheerful, undaunted by the hot sun, undisturbed by cold rains, unafraid of the rushing winds. Will set out an orchard now. Oscar and Henry Lutz had sent east to their brother for nursery stock, and the Rheinmuellers and Deals ordered fruit trees too. The spindling whips of apples and cherries, with their names still tied upon them, looked a rather hopeless lot, rambling row upon row over the raw prairie. There was always so much to be done. One could never satisfy the demands of work, that taskmaster which drove everyone in the new country before the lash. Sometimes Abby would stand at the door of the Saudi and look across the unshaded prairie where the sunflowers added their brilliant yellow to the blinding yellow of the sun, and standing so for a few moments, she would think of the lovely lady with the bronze tints in her reddish hair. She wanted to be like her, but how could one be a lovely lady when there was not always enough water to keep immaculately clean? Will was her strength and her courage. In one of her hours of depression, she had only to confide her mood to him, to have it lifted by its op his optimism. Everything's going to be all right, he would assure her. Think of the Burlington Road reaching Lincoln last week. Think of it, building right up, everything is. Yes, but Will, there are so many things we need, and I want, oh, Will, I want an organ so bad. I'll be 24 this fall, and my music... My, you're getting old, he would joke her. Most an old woman, ain't you? And then more seriously, maybe you can have your organ next year, Abby girl. We'll have good crops next year. But next year, 1871, the crop like the others was only a half a crop. Will was right about the land. The soil itself was rich enough, but the rains held off. Day after day, the clouds as white and dry as puffy as milkweed seeds scudded high with the winds. In the fourth fall, on a mild September day, the air was hazy and they could detect the telltale far-off odor of smoke. Not a man left his home. Will, the Lutz brothers, Gus Reinmuller, all were out for hours plowing wide strips around their places. They knew there were only three things that would stop a prairie fire in its mad wild flight, and even those were ineffective at times. Wide strips of upturned loam upon which there was nothing for the fire to feed, creeks that were wide enough to prevent the flames from leaping them, or a backfire, the burning of a wide strip of prairie grass by the settlers themselves, so that when the flames arrived, they found themselves beaten by their own kind. It was close to three in the afternoon when they saw it roll from the northwest, the black of the smoke and the low running scarlet of the fire. Stove Creek, the best friend in the world to the four families that day, lay between them and the hideous advancing thing. The men, Will and Gus Reinmuller, Henry and Oscar Lutz, all scattered along the creek bed, ready to pounce on any flying embers that might cross the deadline. All afternoon, the women carried wet gunny sacks back and forth. They could see the little house where Oliver Johnson batched it, standing in the way of the angry flames. Oliver himself came across the creek over to the deal side, 
riding one horse and leading the other, a big wash boiler in front of him. He had been away, he said, and arrived home only in time to grab a boiler, thrust his Sunday suit, some money, and a tin type of his girl into it, and leave. Even as they talked, they saw the little house catch fire and almost immediately a great bunch of geese feathers flying up into the air like a puff of white smoke. There goes my mother's feather bed, was Oliver's laconic remark, as he fell into the work of wetting the gunny sacks along with the others. When the last of the jaws of flame ceased reaching for their prey, the land across the creek was a desolate black waste. The trees on the north bank charred and gone. One more enemy was temporarily vanquished, but it had left its mark on the land and the fear of it branded forever in the minds of the settlers. The next spring, the State Board of Agriculture, through a resolution offered by J. Sterling Morton, a Nebraska city man, set aside the 10th of April as a special day on which the settlers should plant trees. They called it Arbor Day. Although Will had set out a great many trees previously, he spent the day adding to his own windbreaks and hauling cottonwood sapling for Henry Lutz, who was sick at the time. When Henry was up again, he built an addition of two rooms on his house and opened a store in one of them. The stock consisting of six brooms, ten bolts of cloth, a dozen bottles of patent medicine, and a few staple groceries. His first customer was Christine Reinmuller, who bought brown denim for her baby's dress. She put one corner of the goods between her teeth and pulled on it. Everything. Sigh, rice. Rip. She jerked the cloth to test its strength. You think this, Sai Rice, rip nine? A few rods to the east of the Lutz combination store and house, Oscar Lutz built a blacksmith shop and hired a blacksmith preacher to do the work. For six days, Sam Mowry labored at the anvil, and on the seventh day, the Reverend Samuel Mowry preached three miles away in the schoolhouse known by the appropriate appellation of Sodom College. A store and a blacksmith shop, people began saying, over to the Stove Creek store and then over to Stove Creek. Mail was brought now by a man on horseback en route from Weeping Water to Ashland. Twice a week he would stop with the little packet at the Lutz store, as Henry had been made postmaster. They began to talk about getting a doctor to come in. Will heard of a young Dr. Hornby, who had just arrived at Nebraska City after graduating from Rush. He rode on horseback to interview him and the young fellow returned on his own horse behind Will, his mutton chop whiskers blowing back against his pink-cheeked boyish face, his medicine case and valise tied on the saddle. A store, a post office, a blacksmith shop, a preacher and a doctor, and all in two buildings, the town had begun. It was Sarah Lutz and Abby Deal who began talking about the crudeness of the Stove Creek title. They were both setting out little cedar trees, Sarah in a clump behind the store and Abby in a row in the front of the Saudi. Cedar City, Abby, Sarah said suddenly. Or Cedar Town, Abby said. Yes, I believe I like that best. All in one word, Cedar Town. A store and a blacksmith shop. But the Deals and the Lutzes, the Reverend Samuel Mowry and his wife and Dr. Hornby would all correct any passerby who asked innocently if this was Stove Creek. Cedar Town, they would say impressively. And so, Minerva-like, Cedar Town had sprung forth from the brow of the prairie. The crop of that year, 1872, was as poor as that of the previous summer. In September, Abby's third child was born. Sarah was there helping now, and Christine was at home with her own new baby. The child was a son, healthy, loud-voiced, hungry. Abby and Will joked a little over the size of their family, and they argued some over the newcomer's name. Will wanted to call him John. It doesn't sound right, Abby protested. John Deal. It's too short, like Tic Tac or Potluck. Oh, I don't care, Will give in readily enough. I just liked it. It sounds solid and substantial, as though he might amount to something. Abby pulled the little soft sleeping form into the hollow of her arm. I know he'll amount to something. After that, she could not get the thought of John out of her mind. John deals, she said it over several times. Will's right, it just fits him. 
Someday people will say, go and ask John Deal. He's a smart man. He can advise you. She lay and smiled at the vision. If the faith of all mothers could blossom to its full fruition, there would be no unsuccessful men in the land. Mac was nearly six now and Margaret four, so that when Abby was up again and strong enough, she began to teach them their letters. Will painted a board with black paint and brought some soft chalk-like deposit from the plat with which they could print. The oldest Ryan Mueller and Lutch children had started to school at Sodom College, but Abby would not let Mac go so far. So to her other labors, she now added teaching. All winter during the deep snows, when they were shut in, she gave the children lessons to do, hearing them recite in their queer little ways while she was mending or mixing bread or ironing. It was tiresome shut in the small soddy, and spring was a welcome guest. On Easter morning, accompanied by the faithful dog who would kill a snake whenever he found one, Abby took Mac and Margaret and little John down to the creek bank for flowers. Will had made a wagon in which to pull John, the wheels of round discs cut from a young cottonwood, and now at seven months the baby lay in it and blinked solemn eyes at the April sky. It was an advanced spring, and they found blue and yellow violets, Dutchman's breeches, ferns, and the tiny red buds of the hawthorn. Smell, said Abby. Smell the springtime on the prairie. And Mac and Margaret stood and sniffed miniature olfactory organs. What makes it smell sweet, they wanted to know. Because everything, every little wild plum blossom, every little tiny crocus and anemone, and violet and every tree bud and grass blade is working to help make the prairie nice, Abby told them. And who is there to say that this was not a beginner's class in philosophy? The day was hot with a strong wind from the south, so they did not stay long at the creek bed. On the way back to the house it clouded and by the time they reached it the drops were falling. In the night the rain changed to snow. And when the family awoke in the early morning, the storm was shrieking around the Saudi with cyclonic fury. Great wet clumps of snow were being hurled against the small half windows, and snow had been driven through the cracks of the door. The wind and the snow, whirling together in their wild bacchanalia, seemed laughing drunkenly at the tiny pygmy inmates of the tiny prairie house. Will started to open the door to go to his stock and could scarcely shut it again against the storm's rage. In the brief interval of its half-opening, huge chunks of soft snow with a rush and a roar of wind had been thrown the length of the room. With the life of the stock depending on him, he made another attempt to leave the house in the afternoon. He succeeded in getting to the barn, but came back discouraged, for the snow had blown through every crack and crevice. By the third day of this holocaust of natures, the storm abated. Will found some of the chickens dead, and his horses and three cows had stamped so much snow under their feet that their backs were nearly at the top of the shed. There were dead prairie chickens everywhere, and the trees along the creek bank, where the little family had so recently picked violets, were packed so solid to make a snow wall. The snows melted and the creek rose. The flowers bloomed again, and the summer was upon the land. But if the previous years had been hard, that one seemed to reach the lowest point of the settlers' existence. The panic of 1873 was upon the state. The bottom of the market dropped out and prices were so low that it did not even pay to haul the scanty crop to market. When eggs were five cents a dozen and butter eight cents a pound, cattle and hogs two cents, wheat fifty cents a bushel and corn eight, of what use to haul them all 30 or 40 miles? Of what use to haul a load of corn a day's journey and bring back a load of coal which costs more than the corn? So Will and Abby, along with the neighbors, began burning the corn for fuel. It made a fire of intensity, a fire that crackled and held its heat as well as any coal. Sometimes, too, they used hard twisted hay. When the winter came on, Will took Abby's wash boiler and, removing the two front lids of the cook stove, turned the boiler upside down over the open holes, forming a sort of drum that seemed to heat the room a little better. The crop of 1874 was the sixth crop and it seemed to give a little more promise than the previous ones. By the 20th of July, Will had laid by all his corn. 
Most of his small grain was in the shocks, but one oat field of a few acres was still uncut. Standing there under the July sun, its ripened surface seemed to reflect back on the yellow rays. In the afternoon, Abby went out to pick a mess of beans. The garden had come to be Abby's care. Aside from the potato crop to which Will attended, she looked after the entire garden. It was quite generally so, the men bending all their energies to bigger things, the corn and the wheat and the stock, with the chickens in the gardens falling to the lot of the wives. Some of the women went into the fields. Christine Reinmuller was out there beside Gus many days. Will drew the line at that. When you have to do that, we'll quit, he said. Abby in her starched sunbonnet began picking beans for supper. She could see Will and Henry Lutz working together shocking the last of Henry's oats. Tomorrow, the two would work together on Will's last stand. It was nice for the men to be so neighborly. It seemed hazy in the west. By the time she had finished the low rows, a big pan full of yellow pods in her arms, Will had come home from the Lutzes. In the welcome shade of the house, Abby took off her bonnet, wiped her flush perspiring face, and waited for Will to come up. My, it's a scorcher. She looked hot and tired. In a moment of tenderness, more to be desired because of its rarity, Will picked up Abby's hands. The slender nails were stubbed and broken. The grime of the garden was on her tapering fingers. He lifted her hand and suddenly kissed the hollow of it. As his lips touched the calloused palm, his eyes filled with rare tears. He uttered a short, swift oath. I wish you didn't have to, Abby girl. It's tough for you. Some day in a few years, we'll pull out. Weather conditions may change. The land will be high. You can have better things and your organ. That singing and painting of yours. Maybe we can get to a teacher then. It affected Abby as it always did. In a moment like that, it seemed the end and aim of everything, the family. All her dreams for herself were as nothing. In her own moment of emotion, she returned, We'll make it, Will. Don't worry. For a moment, they stood together looking out over the raw, rolling acreage. Even as they looked, the sun darkened and the day took on a grayness. They stood and they looked for the storm and heard it as soon as they saw it. A great black cloud roared out of the west with a million little hissing vibrations. Their eyes on the sky neither moved. Then there was a cessation of the roaring, a soft thud of dropping things, and the cloud of a billion wings lay on the fields. Grasshoppers, they said simultaneously, incredulously. The grasshoppers swarmed over the young waist-high corn and the pasture in the garden. By evening, the long rows of sweet corn had been eaten to the plowed ground. The tender vines of the tomatoes were stripped down to the stalk. The buds of the fruit trees were gone. Part of the garden was a memory. The chickens had feasted themselves to the bursting point. Gus Reinmuller, driving up to the door, could hardly control his rearing horses. So irritated were they by the bouncing, thumping pests. The farm was a squirming, greenish-gray mass of them. All evening, Will sat by the stove with his head in his hands. It was the first time he had visibly lost his grit. Abby went over to him and ran her hand through his hair. She tried to think of something to console him. Don't, Will. There's one thing we can do. There's the string of pearls. We can always fall back on it. There must be jewelry stores in Omaha that would take it and pay well. You take the team and make the drive. You can do it in three days. I'll look after things here. When mother gave the pearls to me, she said, you'll ne'er starve with them. And we won't, Will. We'll sell them for the children's sake. Will threw her hands away from his hair roughly and stood up. Hell no, he yelled at her. I've taken your music away from you and your painting and your teaching and some of your health, but by God, I won't take your mother's present to you. He slammed through the rough, soddy door and went to the barn.